Hello, everybody. I welcome you to uh, the third speaker in the joint CSC, NL, uh, CSC IST NLP colloquium, who also happens to be our Kelly Distinguished Speaker for today. So I'm going to give her a little bit of a longer introduction than I usually do. And also, um, I have something to present to her. So uh, you will have read about her incredible achievements. Uh, and I will briefly touch on some of the highlights of these before I tell you something that's a little bit more from my personal perspective. <clears throat> so Julia is the Percy K. and Vita L. W. Hudson professor. And she's the chair of computer science at Columbia University. I was going to look up how long you had been chair, but it's um, sixth year. <laughs> Are you reading? Good, 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 yeah. Uh, well, I'm sure that as the chair, she has um, created a climate of um, great uh, stimulation and energy and opportunity because uh, she's done that very often. Before coming to Columbia, she was at Bell Labs and uh, AT&T Labs and created the HCI research department. Uh, a lot of people that were there have had a big impact uh, ever since then. She's been editor of uh, many um, journals like Computational Linguistics, Speech Communication. She's a fellow of you know, all these different organizations that have three letters, a uh, member of the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, she's also uh, played a big role in diversity. So she's co-chair of the CRAW board um, the, um, and has worked for diversity for many years at both institutions that she's been at. And uh, her areas of research are natural language processing, spoken natural language, studying text-to-text -text, uh, speech synthesis, spoken dialogue systems, the topic of her talk today, entrainment and conversation. She also looks at uh, detecting deceptive and emotional speech, hedging behavior, code switching, and uh, those are just the highlights of the things she's worked on. Now, um, that's a lot of achievement for one person. And, you know, other people have achieved maybe as much, but one thing you uh, don't see in Julia's record there that is that her first doctorate is not CS. She got a doctorate before that in history, very different area. And her first employment was at Smith College where she was teaching history. And she sometimes tells an interesting story about how she switched to CS almost by accident, which I have heard, and I'm not sure it's quite true. Uh, but somehow seeing her accomplishments um, I can't help but think that there was something not at all accidental about it, that she saw an arena where she could really have a lot of impact and that she was very curious about. I met her when we were both in grad school. She was uh, going back for her second doctorate at the University of Pennsylvania, and I was going for my first and only one uh, at the University of Chicago in linguistics. And uh, she, I, I think I got my first job in part through her, and that was in an AI uh, research group. And so I, I think she not only was very comfortable switching around from history to CS, and then in CS she did her thesis on pragmatics, but then soon after she finished she started uh, working more on prosody. So I think she thinks everybody can do it, and she got me to do it too. And I'm very glad she did. So without further ado, I introduce Julia Hirschberg talking about prosodic entrainment and dialogue, language, and social impact. Oh, thank you so much, Becky. I didn't realize I had had an impact on, in that particular way. And it really is true that I got into computer science a bit accidentally. <laughs> but once I got started on it, I loved it. It was the most fun I'd ever, I love to code. And hopefully, once I'm no longer chair, I'll have more opportunity to do this. I don't know. Uh, thank you guys so much for inviting me here. I have not been to Penn State before. It's a beautiful campus. I really envy you all the lovely space. And uh, I, we probably have similar weather, so at any rate, thanks very much. So I'm going to talk about something that I worked on for quite a while, and I'm continuing to work on it with some former PhD students and a former uh, postdoc, which is prosodic entrainment and dialogue. And I know um, some of you in this room, well, here are my collaborators that I want to um, acknowledge because without them, of course, none of this would have been possible. And there are about, I would say, 20 to 30 other um, 
uh, project students who've been helping us with these uh, with this uh, investigation as well and their names wouldn't fit on this slide. So at any rate, these are the PhD students and uh, former postdoc Stefan Bench. Uh, this is a picture uh, just to show you what my lab looks like. It's a little small, I guess. Um, there in the back is a, um, a, a, a speech um, recording booth where we did most of the recordings for this project. And these are some PhD students and project students in my lab. And as you can say, see, we have a lot of diversity in the lab, and we're proud of that. So here's a real world example that I got one of the last times I gave this talk. A friend of mine at uh, Carnegie Mellon, Maxine Eskenazi, um, sent me this email. She was waiting for a long time for the elevator, and she heard two undergraduates talking. One, she says, is a senior, the other is a junior. And the senior has relatively high pitch, a light, pleasant voice, and talked at a, what Maxine thought was a normal speed. The junior uh, was giving opinions on the other person's uh, activities, and she had a lot of vocal fry, a creaky voice like this, and low pitch and fast speech, which <laughs> Maxine commented on seems to be more normal for undergraduates nowadays. As the conversation went on, Maxine said she noticed that the senior was becoming faster and faster in her speaking rate, and the last part she heard was that the senior was now in the junior's pitch range as well, and starting to show this vocal fry. So this is attested to by one of my colleagues, and it's a great example of what we call acoustic and prosodic entrainment. Some of you I know are, um, <laughs> rather close, some of you I know are familiar with this phenomenon, and some of you looking at it in your own work. Um, entrainment is also sometimes called alignment or adaptation. Uh, sometimes people mean slightly different things by using uh, one or the other of those terms. It's also called the chameleon effect. And basically, the idea is that in conversation, you and I tend to adapt our communicative behavior to that of our conversational partner. Um, this is, according to theorists, a non-conscious mimicry of postures, mannerisms. It's not just speech. It can be your posture. It can be the way you use your hands when you're speaking. It can be your facial expression. For example, it's been found that people who smile more tend to evoke smiling at other people, which is an important thing to remember if you <laughs> want to accomplish some uh, social uh, accommodation and other um, interactions. Also, if you laugh, other people will tend to laugh more as well. Um, even if you use filled pauses, um, uh, the person you're talking to may also tend to use more of those. It doesn't always happen, and there are a lot of social dimensions to this behavior. So the basic idea is that it's unintentional. You don't think about it as you're doing it. Um, it's an unintentional, non-conscious effect of social perception on social behavior. So, as I was saying, uh, many people have worked on this, um, some in this room. Uh, there has been evidence of entrainment in lexical use, lexical choice, in syntactic choice. Uh, there has been a good deal in acoustic and prosodic information and different uh, aspects of that. Um, phonological phonetic means that if I pronounce words like someone in Long Island and I'm from Manhattan, uh, I will begin <laughs> in a very short period of time to adopt a Long Island accent, which is very distinctive in the New York area. This has been shown by Jen Pardo um, in a really interesting study um, uh, a lab study of uh, bringing people in, having them uh, say a sentence, having them speak very briefly to a person with a different accent and then say the same sentence, and the difference was noticeable to judges. Um, there are also cult social cultural jokes and laughter, facial expression, 
uh, gesture. What I really like is posture, <laughs> since I'm always trying to stand up straight. So if the person I'm talking to has really good posture, hopefully I will uh, mimic that a bit. And there's also been some more recent work on brain oscillation and speech amplitude and the relationship between those two. So the interesting thing from a more practical point of view, um, and the reason why companies are interested in entrainment, I've talked to a number of them, um, subjects who entrain are perceived as more socially attractive. They're even perceived as smarter and more competent and the conversation is perceived as more intimate. So entrainment can lead subjects to like their conversational partners better and to perceive the interactions as more successful. And long-term syntactic entrainment is a good predictor of task success. So you can imagine if a company is producing a spoken dialogue system or even a self-driving car, it may well want that the output of that car and conversation or of that robot. In fact, I just talked to Roberto Pieraccini, uh, who uh, is one of the uh, researchers on Jibo, which just got on the cover of Time magazine as one of the top inventions of 2017. And he wants people to like Jibo more, so he wants to talk to me about working on entrainment together. So there are lots of practical reasons, but there are also some personal reasons why this is an important phenomenon. So basically, <coughs> the way we ended up studying entrainment was in a very, as most of my, my life, I think, is you don't really go set out starting to do something, but then you think, oh, hmm, I got the data. Why don't we look at X? So we had originally collected the Columbia Games Corpus uh, this is my uh, former PhD student, August Gravano, who graduated from Columbia in 2009. Uh, we wanted to study the given new phenomenon, which is the idea that if I say a word, the cat is beautiful, the cat is really funny. The second time I say it, I will um, uh, decrease my pitch range and the emphasis that I have on cat. So that's what we wanted to study, because people do all sorts of different things when they uh, utter a given expression. Um, so we collected 12 spontaneous, and these were task-oriented conversations. We got about nine hours of speech. Um, now for us, this is considered rather a, a small, but at the time it was a pretty big amount of speech because we also um, basically uh, transcribed it all and we did Toby annotations, prosodic annotations on this data. So we had two subjects playing a series of computer games with no eye contact. The reason we said we put a blanket between them actually in a pole in my speech lab booth, a uh, rather primitive means of keeping them from seeing because we wanted to focus on the acoustic, prosodic, and lexical cues to entrainment and not have to deal with the interaction of gestures, body gestures, uh, uh, speech um, expressions. So and the nice thing about this is we had two subjects, uh, two sessions for each subject. So they came, they talked to one person, and then they came back a couple weeks later and they talked to another person and played these games. And we had two different game types, which I'll show you in a minute. We recorded these on separate channels in our soundproof booth we digitized them and downsampled, and we extracted the features at the time uh, with PROT, which is an open source speech analysis uh, library. So this is the cards game. Basically, you see cards on your screen that are different from the cards that your partner sees on their screen, and you have to describe them, and your goal is to make a match, or at least as close a match as possible, between a card on your screen and a card on the other screen. Why did we do this? We just wanted to elicit a lot of speech, and we wanted people to be talking about objects that we knew were there, were visible, that we could plan in advance what objects they should be talking about. And this was all so that we could vary things like, how uh, long ago did you see this object? How many times have you seen it? Things like that. 
so that we could test this given new phenomenon. How do you describe an object that you've seen more times? How do you describe an object that you've seen more recently? And it depends on how many objects are given in the thing. So that was the goal. And subjects were pretty OK with playing this game. Um, I think we talked to a game developer. And she was very good about telling us ways that you can make a game more exciting and get people engaged. Because that's what you want to do when you're doing these experiments. You want people to really be participating and interested in what they're doing. So the objects game was even more successful. In this game, these are the two different um, views, one seen by the describer and the other by the follower. And basically, the goal was to take um, this red object, the red plane, and put it on your screen in exactly the same place that it had been placed on the describer's screen. And the describer had to tell you how to do that. And we gave them more points to the pixel. They got more points the closer they got to the actual spot. And here, if I can play this, is just a simple example. OK. <coughs> So my blinking image is, a, is the red plane, mm -hmm. red airplane. And it's between the light bulb and the pineapple. Sure. It's in line with the light bulb and the pineapple. Okay. And it's directly underneath the belt. OK. OK, I think that's the end. So as you see, in this case, it's reasonably easy to describe. But it's not exactly where she described it. And so they're going to get more points if they can do it to the pixel. OK, so this just describes the corpus. And here were the units of analysis we used. We defined something we call the interposal unit, or IPU, which is a pause-free segment of speech, um, 50 milliseconds or more between this speech and the next speech that the speaker produces from a single speaker. This just al allows us to divide up a single turn into multiple chunks that are prosodically um, interpretable and that may be semantically interpretable as well. And so this is just an example of speech silence, speech silence. And we also looked at the turn. Uh, which would be a sequence of speech from one speaker without intervening speech from another, except for back channels, and a session, which would be the whole interaction between these two subjects in a particular game. OK, and that's just our IPU. So everybody's clear on the diff three different ways that we could analyze this data. We looked at these low-level prosodic features. Um, intensity, mean, max, and min. Um, F0, mean, max, and min. Speaking rate. And we also looked at voice quality features, like I was talking about um, the uh, creaky voice. We also looked at things that are indicators of creak. And this is just a spectrogram with um, intensity and F0 uh, there displayed. So we looked at three types of entrainment, um, or three ways in which people could be uh, realizing this unconscious mimicry. One is the simple one that most people had used, which is just proximity or similarity. How similar is my pitch range over a certain stretch of speech to that of my uh, conversational partner? independently of how it got there. Just let's take the means. Uh, convergence, which for me seems more interesting, uh, that is, do we see an increase in the similarity over time? So do people get closer together in their pitch or in their intensity, as in Maxine's example of the two kids that she saw in, in front of the elevator? They, got, they converged. They got more similar. And then synchrony, and this would be something that we've also found, which is I may not match your pitch, but as you raise your pitch, I raise mine. As you lower your pitch, I lower mine. Okay. So these are three different metrics that we can use for uh, detecting entrainment. 
And these are just uh, to give you a picture of those. So as you see, the problem with similarity is you can have vast differences, but the means may turn out to be the same. But we also looked at overall, over a long stretch, over a session, are you similar? And also we looked at similarity on a more local level. And we were, I believe, some of the first people to find similarity on a local level, which seems to make more sense. It's not like you're you know, waiting, <laughs> going through this whole long stretch of speech, but as you go, there is some kind of unconscious mimicry of what your partner is doing. Um, we also looked at synchrony, which can be exact or relative, and we looked at convergence. You can have convergence or divergence or neither one. So here's how we um, operationalized our uh, identification of um, entrainment in our corpus. Uh, remember I said we had originally built this corpus for a completely different purpose. So basically, I had a new PhD student. We started looking at this corpus. What else can we do with it? And we became interested in entrainment uh, through some work I did with people in uh, KTH in Stockholm. And we decided to, well, let's look at it. Let's see if, like others have done, you can, because no, note also, we have a measure of task success, which is how, how many points do the people get in their particular um, game. So we looked at partner similarity, that is, how different are you from your partner, and the opposite of that, the negation of that would be your similarity. We looked at also, remember I said these people each talked to two different partners, right? So we looked at um, similarity between this speaker and their partner versus all other people they did not talk to. So take all nine people they didn't talk to, average their pitch, for example, and see how similar that is to the speaker in question. Because of course what we want to find out is it's more similar to the person they talked to than to all the people that they didn't talk to. Is that clear to everybody? Yes, okay. And we also did something. So we had this before we got these people to play the games. We gave them a norming session. And this was just something where we asked them, you know, things like, gee, you know, why did you come to Columbia? And they would just tell us sort of a monologue of some discussion. So we had the speech of this person before they talked to anybody, basically. Before they talked to one partner, before they talked to another partner. So this we call self-similarity. How much does your pitch, say, change from what your normal pitch is when you're not really talking to anybody but just producing a monologue? So we looked at similarity, then we looked at synchrony in terms of a positive correlation between, say, the pitch of these two partners uh, versus the pitch of this partner with people they didn't talk to. And we also looked at convergence, which is how much uh, greater was the convergence between these two people that talked together than it was with the people that they had never talked to before. So these were our measures. And we also looked at local entrainment, and this turned out to be really cool because um, people had not looked at this much before, and we found some very good results. So basically, we would take the end IPU of my um, phrase, uh, my turn, and then we would match it to um, the first IPU of, say, Becky's turn. And we would see, um, first of all, how similar these pairs were over the whole stretch of the session, but we also um, looked at whether they got closer together toward the end of the session, or whether they seemed to go back and forth, up and down, in synchrony throughout the course of the session. So that's all clear. We're doing everything at the global level. We're looking at a whole session and looking at these three measures, but we're also looking at this local entrainment. Now, this was it, again, <laughs> A lot of things when you're an academic or when you're a researcher 
happen by chance. And you're lucky if they do, and you've got to seize the moment. So this was an interesting experience. A, a Chinese student from um, Tangqi University uh, came, well, contacted us and said she had produced a corpus for exactly the same purpose as ours had not been done for, but she had actually done this deliberately. She had collected a corpus, and she didn't know how to analyze it. So she wanted to look at entrainment among native speakers of Mandarin Chinese that she had recorded, doing slightly different games. Uh, so she had a lot of sessions, a lot more speakers than we did, um, and she wanted to come and work with us. So she had 12 hours of dialogue. She uh, had elicited two different types of games, which actually we're thinking about uh, using for another purpose now, I'll tell you about later. So this was a picture ordering task. So I see game, these pictures in one order on my screen, and you see these pictures on one order in yours, and we have to put them in the same order. And the point here was, again, just to get people to talk to each other, right? Then she had another one also with these pictures, where, and this is the one I think we might be using for another project um, with different pictures. Um, this was, uh, you see these, you both see these pictures, and it's more of a collaboration. So you want to classify them in the same set of bins, right? And she didn't tell them how many, she just said, classify these into the basic topics you think they match to. And again, that was to elicit lots and lots of conversation. So what we did once we had helped Shirley to analyze her data in the same way we had analyzed our games corpus, we decided that we wanted to do a comparative study. What kind of entrainment do we find in English, among English speakers? What kind do we find in Mandarin Chinese? Are there similarities and what are the differences? And we found actually surprising similarities. We did not expect this. We thought, oh, that's cool about this is we're going to find some interesting differences that then we'll map to cultural differences. Actually, we found a lot of similarities on multiple uh, metrics. Now, this just basically gives you um, a summary of what we found in English, what we found in Mandarin Chinese, and it gives you the opportunity to compare those two findings. And you'll see here we're looking at global and local measures. So in global similarity, we found a lot of um, global similarity, we found a lot of cross-cultural similarity in entrainment. In terms of intensity mean and intensity max. Um, we also found some in Mandarin Chinese on pitch in terms of global similarity and some uh, also in both cases on speaking rate. So what we're finding is that there's a lot of similarity in terms of intensity, which is how loud you speak, which is what Maxine had noted that uh, that was being entrained to in her two um, students, and in, um, also in speaking rate. In terms of local similarity, we found similar things, that people were adapting or were unconsciously imitating the other in terms of intensity, and there's some in terms of a speaking rate for Mandarin Chinese. We also found some evidence for Mandarin Chinese of synchrony, and we also found in uh, Standard American English some convergence in pitch, in speaking rate, and in a, a measure of voice quality. Local conversions did not uh, actually produce many results. So the summary is we found similarity in certain acoustic prosodic features. Uh, we found some synchrony in intensity and pitch for the Mandarin Chinese uh, speakers, more so than the English speakers. And we found some convergence at the more global le level for uh, speakers of standard American English. So basically what we're saying here, oops, is that there's some similarities that we were surprised to find, and there are also some differences. And so the issues are, uh, how do those, uh, how can those or should those be explained? Um, 
and uh, that's for a, another discussion. Unfortunately, Shirley was trying to come back for another year and didn't get any funding. So if any of you know of any good funding for a wonderful Chinese uh, faculty member, uh, we would love to hear about it. So uh, having this basic, you know, acoustic and prosodic information, um, we also had done some work on lexical entrainment that I won't mention here. Um, we decided to look at the social dimensions of entrainment, which is, of course, of great interest to psychologists and uh, sociologists and sociolinguists. So you will recall that people who entrain are more socially attractive. They're perceived as more competent, even when exactly the same information is being presented by uh, an entraining presenter versus a non-entraining presenter, and the speech is perceived as more intimate. And the cool thing is, for people who want to make friends, uh, entrainment leads subjects to like their conversational partners more, um, and to perceive their interactions as more successful. And it's also a good predictor of task success. So what we did, we brought in good old crowdsourcing. How many of you use crowdsourcing in your work? How many of you have actually participated as a worker in crowdsourcing? <laughs> good work. <laughs> we need more. <laughs> Um, so basically, we had uh, Mechanical Turk workers label um, the object games from the Columbia Games Corpus. Um, we asked them first, they, they would listen to a stretch of speech, and then we would ask them questions about that stretch of speech, but the speech would include not only one person, it would be a two-party, a uh, small conversation. So we asked, uh, does person X believe that he or she is better than her partner? Uh, is the person X making it difficult for person Y to speak? Does person X seem engaged in the game, seem to dislike the partner? Is this person bored with the game? Is this person trying to direct the conversation? Is this person frustrated with their partner? You see a lot of questions encouraging, trying to dominate the conversation? Is the person trying to make themselves clear? Are they planning what they are going to say? Are they polite? Are they trying to be liked? Sometimes people will entrain rather deliberately because they want to be liked by their conversational partner. These are probably cognitive scientists, I don't know, who actually know that this might work. And that doesn't always get perceived as they would like it to. Sometimes people think, ew. Um, so there, we also ask them questions about the conversation as a whole. Does it flow naturally or is it awkward? Are the people having trouble understanding each other? Which person do you like more and who would you rather have as a partner? So all of these questions are somehow tied to those basic theoretical proposals that I made to you earlier. Does an entraining conversation seem to be a more successful one? Do the people seem to be liking each other more? Now, true, it's third party um, observations of this. So it's not the people themselves. Uh, and we wish that we had thought to do that, but of course we collected the data for a completely different purpose. Okay, so here again are the hypotheses from the literature and what we thought they might um, lead to or that our um, findings might be correlated with. So communication accommodation theory, we thought giving encouragement would be positively uh, correlated with entrainment. And conversational awkwardness, if people are saying, oh, this conversation is very awkward, we thought, mm, the hypothesis was if it was an entraining conversation, it wouldn't be perceived as awkward, but if it was not one, it might be more likely to. Um, similarity attraction theory, trying to be liked, 
we thought might be positively correlated unless people overdo it and are perceived as trying to manipulate the other person by acting like that other person. And then dependency over accommodation. This is an interesting one. It occurs when an interlocutor appears to be trying to dominate or control the conversation. And sometimes this can lead to it. How many people have had conversations like that where you felt that the other person was trying? Has anybody not had conversations <laughs> like that? Um, at any rate, we thought that this might, excessive entrainment might have that uh, perception on the part of our judges. Um, so here are the findings. Some of them were substantiated by the, uh, the Turkers' uh, comments, and some were not. So we did see that when judges perceive people as trying, the partner is trying to be given encouragement, it was positively correlated with the entrainment that we had found in that conversation. However, <laughs> perceived conversational awkwardness was weakly positively correlated with entrainment, which may have something to do with some of the other ways that people can use entrainment in ways to dominate the conversation. Um, when people perceived that a person was trying to be liked, this was positively correlated with entrainment. So they said, mm, trying to be liked. They're trying to match that person's conversation, but the raiders didn't like those people. So they thought that was a bad thing to do. And there was no correlation between perceived dominance and entrainment. So um, in some ways, some of uh, the theories about entrainment were substantiated by our, to be fair, um, naive readers. And some of them did not seem to be supported. OK. So, um, as Becky said, my early work, and much of my current work, thank goodness, <laughs> is on prosody. And one thing we thought we might check out in this corpus was, are people in training, not simply in pitch range or intensity or in the more basic acoustic features, but are they in training on um, what we're um, well, Toby labels. How many of you have heard of Toby? A few. It's a prosodic labeling scheme that's really popular now for multiple languages, many, many languages. And some of my friends and I were instrumental in producing this. So most of my data is labeled in this way. And basically, um, Toby annotation simply uh, labels pitch accents by type. Because in English, if you say a word in a particular um, way and make it prominent in a particular way, you can convey very different meanings. And then we also uh, labeled phrase accents, which is, do you go up at the end of a phrase? Do you go down at the end of a phrase? It's pretty simple. Uh, and also boundary tones, which are just ends of larger IPUs. So basically, these are just intonational contours. I'll give you an example, a statement in English. I really like that cat. A question in English. I really like that cat. So th that would be differences in two very different intonational contours. Everybody's probably familiar with that. And different languages have different conventions for that. At any rate, um, what we wanted, so basically the Toby annotation has a tonal tier that labels things like that. We also label um, the words and time align them so we know what's being said, since we know our labeling how it's said. And a break index tier, how much of a boundary is at the end of this phrase. OK, so these are the things that we want to see. Are people in training at this level? of prosody, not just at the you know, kind of low level acoustic stuff, but actually how they are producing contours in their speech. And this is just an example of a Toby labeled uh, segment, which I guess I don't, I'm not gonna play, but is that Mariana's money? Would be the way it would be said. Okay, so August decided to look at entrainment on pitch contours and match them with the social variables that we had labeled. 
So he did came up with three different ways of measuring contour similarity between speakers. And this is just when I use a contour, how likely is it that you will use that same contour very close to mine? So he looked at perplexity of language models of sequences that are trained on one speaker and used to model prosodic sequences of the other speaker. So basically, a low perplexity would indicate better similarity. He also looked at Levenstein distance of similar intonational contours used by A and B. And low values here would show that similar contours are uttered more closely together than dissimilar contours, OK? And then kullback leibler divergence between these contours, low values here will show that one is a subset of the other. And all these are just different ways of trying to measure are speaker A's contours significantly similar to speaker B's when compared to all other uh, contours, uh, that different contours in that particular conversation. So basically, um, August built a 24-dimensional vector with the value for, of uh, each of these items for each member of a speaker pair and a similar vector for the social variables. For example, social uh, board with the game, where the raiders had agreed on a particular uh, uh, score for that category, for this particular um, chunk of speech. And just ran some correlation tests on these two vectors and the social variable vectors. So the social variable vectors and then these different measures of contour similarity. And here's what he found, which is quite interesting, I think, and certainly deserves more investigation from people who are looking at um, the way people imitate at a sort of higher prosodic level than just in intensity and speaking rate. So, um, there t so in each case, you'll find, um, except for um, two, that there were um, positive correlations or positive or negative, significant positive or negative correlations between these social variables and the um, smaller differences between um, contours that people are producing or the greater similarity between the contours people are using. So making oneself clear was positively correlated with having more similar, uh, closer together contours, giving encouragement also on two metrics. Being engaged in the game was positive on two, but negative on one. So there, you know, we have a mixed message. Um, and all of these other things contributes to successful task completion, since it did, uh, according to our data, uh, everybody thought that that was actually true when the contours that people were using were more similar. Um, trying to be liked, only one. Planning what to say, a couple. Um, the things that we thought were negative were sometimes positively correlated. Like making it, this is the one that we couldn't figure out before. Making it difficult for somebody to speak uh, was positively correlated with using similar intonational contours. Don't, who knows? There are always going to be things, results you get that you can't explain. You try to come up with this story, but it is what it is. However, bored with the game, when people are perceived as bored with the game, they do not use similar intonational contours. So that's an interesting thing to note. Okay. So, um, here are the conclusions. Uh, I think the, the later work for us, because here we have hand annotated uh, Toby labels. So another one of my students uh, did his PhD dissertation on developing classification systems that would automatically label these same variables. And for our next round of work on this, we'll probably uh, not do the hand labeling, which takes years. Um, but actually do the automatic labeling, which is fairly accurate, actually, to see whether in our other corpora we see similar kinds of phenomena. 
Okay, so on to uh, a more uh, interactive uh, set of experiments. We decided to take these conclusions and findings that we had from one corpus and see if we could put this into an actual spoken dialogue system. So basically we want to perceive automatically that people are, perfect, are um, uh, speaking in a particular uh, pitch range. Uh, we tried pitch range, that didn't work too well for various reasons I could talk to you about. Uh, so we stuck with rate and intensity, which was much easier to do. So we measure a person's speaking rate, we measure their intensity of an utterance, and then we uh, modify our system's voice so that it actually either matches that or de definitely does not match it, tries to diverge from it, okay? And this is why people who are building spoken dialogue systems might actually want to take notice, because you can do this. And if you have like more resources than we did, you can probably do this on um, multiple dimensions. So we, we had them play this go fish game. Um, <laughs> and basically, um, when you have this, this hand here, you want to know what sort of things you should ask for so that you can get a better hand that'll be more successful. You'll have more twos or you'll have better sequence. Um, and so we said, okay, this is your task. It's to get the best hand possible. And we're gonna give you help from two different avatars. These are not the kind of avatars that you think of as avatars, they're just two talking heads. So, Bobby and Freddy. Uh, Bobby and Freddy could be either an entraining voice or an unentraining voice. They gave exactly the same advice to the people playing the game, okay? So the only difference is in hair color, which who knows, uh, we wanted them to be able to tell them apart, and in the voice. Does it entrain to mine in intensity and speaking rate or not? Does it disentrain? Um, that's what it looked like, and you had to ask for help at each time, and basically they would usually, they would sometimes follow, and sometimes they would decide they knew better than Bobby or Freddie. We had 19 participants, and each session was about 45 user turns. Um, very short, took about nine minutes, and we extracted the acoustic prosodic features to get this uh, thing going by Pratt, and we uh, logged all of the interactions. So at the end of this, we gave people a survey. Who gave the better advice? Nobody, you know, it was not significant. Some people would say, but in training, some people not. But whose advice did people usually follow? It was the in-training voice. So that kind of substantiates earlier findings that people perceive the in-training person as more competent, et cetera, et cetera. Which advisor did you like better? The in-training voice. Whose voice did you like better? the entraining voice. Which voice did you find strange or annoying? It was the unentraining voice. Now you might say we could have unentrained a little bit better, but we spent a lot of time making the unentraining voice sound at least natural, if not particularly appealing. So we're doing this now in two different languages, Porteño Spanish and Slovak Go Fish Games. Um, they're only using, at the moment, entrainment on speaking rate, um, not on intensity, although they're adding that. And there's some other uh, variations in their systems. They have different um, TTS systems that they're modifying. Uh, so the results are more similar to English in the Spanish experiments, but there's some issues with entraining a rate uh, in Spanish and Slovak, which I can talk about later. Okay, so this is the last thing I'm gonna talk about. We have a corpus of deceptive speech I talked to some of you students about um, that we have collected laboriously over years. And we have 340 speakers and 122 hours of speech, which is a lot. 
Um, and basically, we invited people into the lab. They took turns interviewing each other, and we told the interviewee to lie about half of the questions. So the interviewer gets more money if they guess when the interviewee is lying, and the interviewee gets more money if they convince the interviewer that they are not lying, basically. So there's a lot of incentive here. It's the whole key to doing these experiments. You've got to get people engaged, and money is often a good way of doing that. So we're looking at entrainment and asking questions like, um, do people who entrain, are they better are they better at lying, at deceiving the other person? If people entrain, are they better at telling that the other person is lying or not? So are you better at detecting or producing deception if you are entraining to your conversational partner? Um, there is some evidence that speakers um, are more similar, that they do entrain in these sessions where they're lying or telling the truth, uh, we found that people who entrain are better at detecting deception. We haven't found any evidence that they're better at producing plausible deceptive speech, which is kind of interesting. And one thing that we found, which is, we just found this, I'm <laughs> just talking about this last week, that people, while they do seem to entrain in these conversations, they tend to diverge more at the end of the conversation, which is not entirely implausible because one of them is trying to lie, making more money if they can lie. And so I'm not sure the dynamics of this, you know, the social dynamics of this, but what happens is even though overall they are in training, toward the end they're in training much less than they are at the beginning. So interesting. Much more work to do on that. Um, so we're doing more work on entrainment. We're looking at trust. If I entrain to you, do you trust me more? Uh, this is of great interest to people who produce robots <laughs> and I want you to buy them and trust them and use them. Um, we also found, we're doing some work on linguistic code switching. And that's uh, what happens when two people are, um, two bilinguals talk to each other. They tend to switch back and forth between their two languages. Um, and we found that in the Columbia, or not the Columbia, the Miami Bangor corpus that was collected in bars in Miami uh, by some Welch people who were studying uh, code switching, um, that People who code, when I code switch, which I don't do, um, but when someone who does code switch, code switches, the person they're talking to tends to start code switching more. And it's actually a significant effect over the course of these conversations that the more I code switch, the more you code switch. Over. We're going to use this in a way that I've mentioned to a couple of you to try to actually produce spontaneous spoken code switching by using a confederate who starts to code switch in the booth with the subject. So we'll see how that happens. And the other thing we have uh, produced is uh, something we call the lying game, which we're going to use to uh, also demonstrate or identify trust in uh, voices that um, actually match that of the interlocutor versus uh, that do not. So, thank you very much. Um, here are the other people, or the other organizations that we have to thank that have supported uh, this work and are continuing to do some of it. Thank you. Is this on? Uh, yeah. yeah. Before uh, we take any questions, mm -hmm. I just want to oh officially thank uh, Julia for coming to be our Kelly speaker. And we have a plaque of appreciation. Can everybody see that from up there? That says, a Certificate of Appreciation presented to Julia Hirschberg as the James Kelly Distinguished wow. Lecturer on December 1st, 2017. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Luckily, we have the same day. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Oh, this is really beautiful. Plaque. <laughs> so uh, I guess you. we have also time for a few questions. 
Okay. Does anyone have any new questions? Yes. Kate. So, so um, that, that, was, that was very interesting. Uh, awesome work. And uh, I'm always wondering why. Right? Um, you, you, you show you know, what, what a training does. Mm -hmm. But the question for me is do we in training because we want to be more <laughs> likable, because we want to do better work, because we want to go online and, you know, well, yeah, the way people are defining it is unconscious mimicry. Whether it's always unconscious is not so clear, right, to anyone. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I don't consciously entrain, but I find myself doing it because I, of course, studied it. Um, but I've never consciously entrained, but I'm sure I do now. Don't you ever catch yourself kind of... I think about it now as we're having a casual conversation, <laughs> people, and see, am I actually sounding more like this person than I would otherwise? Um, yeah, it's a good question. What you guys can maybe answer it. <laughs> mm. hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, you mean like lexical change or just, eh? well, it's, let's go back to that. I mean, I don't know the answer, but let's go back to what um, Maxine was saying um, in that first example that she found the older student seemed to be imitating the behavior of the more millennial student. Um, and according to Maxine, this way of talking, she believes, is more typical of younger students. So... As younger students talk to each other and, you know, affect the talk of older students, maybe that does lead to some changes in style that are, and we know that happens. And social media certainly leads to changes in emojis and things like that. So interesting. I don't know. So you could do some experiments, right? I don't know about how long term, but one could do some social media experiments and start using more, you know, if you start using an expression <laughs> or a different emoji, how quickly that, I mean, it might take on for a while. I don't know. I think Becky. Well, um, I'm actually going to address the question. All right, that's very good. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes. Do you think of that as an explanation that uh, it could be a kind of social ability that helps people achieve uh, expressing their goals of selective activity? Uh, well, why, yes. Why I mean, yes. And I mean, this is what you know, the whole uh, Amazing Enterprise uh, supports uh, doing, right? Uh, and for Pickering and Garrett and so on. Uh, that, that, you know, we, we're doing this for a reason. But they also saying that we're doing it because it underlies more basic uh, cognitive function. So it is it's, it's largely an, an implicit process, at least that's where you know, that's where it's coming. Make sense? Yeah, and how do you know which it is, yeah. really? Unless, I mean, you could even ask people why, why they do something, but they might not realize that, yeah, there's some consciousness involved in this kind of thing. Well, they're, they're finding their mimicry at many different levels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Or people dress in the same way, right? If I start, you know, working in a band, you know, I'm probably going <laughs> to dress differently, right? And I, I adapt That's to probably body. conscious. Um, and uh, I think that uh, the, I think it's, it's a reasonable hypothesis that, that to think that the uh, small changes that happen at the micro level will over, all, over time lead to longer term uh, persistent changes, and that means language change. Lexical, maybe, that. but syntactic, who knows? Yeah. yeah it is, it's not but it is, yeah. Yeah. Why don't, you know, why don't you change over time? 
but a training to one person is not the same as you know everybody in training in the same way. That's one thing we did find that people are in training in different dimensions. So some people in train and pitch, some people do it in intensity. So there's no over. Of course, you know we didn't have that many subjects, but we have now. <laughs> yeah, Becky. Uh, I, you may have said this in the talk, but I can't remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we couldn't, that's not something that we have been able to study because we were only studying pairs. Um, and so I, I don't, I don't actually know. Um, hmm, I'm not sure we could figure that out from our data. And I don't know anybody, yeah, like what kind of person is more entrained to. The trouble is when you're do the, doing these pairwise studies, you don't know who's in training to whom. You can only look at you know, how they spoke with this person versus how they spoke with everybody they didn't speak to. Um, but you don't know who's making the difference there. So I don't know how you would do that, but it's really would be very, I mean, that's obviously something the roboticists would love to know. <laughs> what kind of person is more likely to be entrained to? Good question. I don't know. And maybe that would depend on different um, yeah. Right. It might not be the same for all people who might potentially speak to that person. Yeah. Hmm, I guess you could find that probably looking at in social media. There, definitely. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Who, who tends to influence the language of their, the people who interact with them, at least in a sort of lexical syntactic manner? Yes. Well, we have uh, shown that it can be integrated into a spoken dialogue system um, by measuring certain measurable features of the um, interlocutor speech. Like you call up a spoken dialogue system, I can measure your speaking rate, I can measure your intensity to a certain degree, but that's more difficult. Pitch should also be a really uh, good uh, thing to measure. It's just that there are some, I can talk to you about this later, but there's some difficulties with, with producing um, entraining pitch and unentraining pitch so that they both sound equally natural. It was just, you know, in the technology we were using. If you were uh, Amazon or um, Microsoft and were really interested in this, you could do a very good job. Um, one thing I should mention is that long ago, back in the 80s, I think, um, the people in um, KTH uh, in Stockholm who worked on TTS and built spoken dialogue systems before people in the U.S. were really doing much at all, uh, found that um, you could get people to entrain uh, lexically to the uh, system speech um, by basically that the people would tend to use the words that the system used when they asked a question. They would call things by the same name. And why is this an important thing to do in a spoken dialogue system? It helps your speech recognition system know what to look for. So it would raise, they would thus, you know, um, boost the value or the probability of the words they were using. And it was very successful. People really do do that. There have been some other dissertations showing that uh, on the CMU core broth, um, that if you use the words, people will, if you use particular words, people will use them back. And thus you can recognize them more accurately. Yep, so it's doable. Anyone else? Oh, sorry. Like if I have a much lower pitch than the person I'm talking to, I can almost, you know, do 
so similar. Right, but you can you can converge and you can do synchrony. So. Uh, yeah, you mean like those are interesting questions. Of course, since we <laughs> we collected the data not for these purposes, we didn't even think about those things. So I don't know. I mean, most of our experiments were done in the early afternoon with college students. I don't know how stressed out they were, or <laughs> I don't know any of that information. So it's an interesting thing to investigate. Do you, are you more able to entrain if your voice is like not, not like mine, more creaky? <laughs> because I really, you know, I can't undo the creak right now, so. Yes, you could study that. I don't know the answer. Um, their limits in range, just human, the range of human capabilities as to how fast people can speak or how high a pitch a particular person. But that's why I think the more um, convergence and synchrony may be more useful measures of entrainment that don't really, aren't so much influenced by capabilities as by, you know, just a tendency in that direction. Good question. Yeah, I mean, with robots, you can probably do it. <laughs> yeah, and again, as Becky was saying, what people are hard to entrain to, and they would probably be people who have really distinctive voices, like a really wide pitch range, maybe, or who speak really fast. That would basically, you know, make it more difficult to entrain to those people. Yeah. Um, so just uh, continuing on this. Sure. Time, what about the time? What is the mm. the yeah. Control. Probably. And you have a lot more opportunity to do it. Yeah, interesting. Do you so basically all of our people, all of our subjects didn't know each other before they came into the lab. So I don't know um, whether there's a, you know, our studies of within family entrainment. Um, there's data on that, certainly. I just don't know. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, people have done a lot of work on written communicate or on entrainment in written communication. We did some. That was one of the first things that we started with. David has done some of that. Um, but you're talking about within person, like do they entrain in both media? Yeah, I mean you might expect that people who entrain. I don't know. <laughs> it's an interest, another interesting question. Um, if you entrain in conversation, do you also tend to entrain in your uh, written interactions? But they'd have to be in, in a different, you know, in different media, right? So I don't know. But we did find uh, good evidence of entrainment in this corpus, just lexical entrainment as well, um, mostly in uh, function words, actually usage. So. Uh, yeah, you can find it everywhere. That's the thing. If you just look, I mean, and if you have corpora, we also looked at the switchboard corpus, and we found that some of that is labeled, the conversations are labeled by third parties to see whether they're good or not, how they rate them. And the entraining ones, lexically entraining ones, were um, significantly more likely to be highly rated. So even in the way that you you know, interact, um, and they were rating just lexical. They weren't listening to the stories, to the conversations. Okay. Well, thank you. Oh, yes, Dave. Just one last question. Sure. Mm -hmm. Do I entrain to some people more than to others? To those that I respect, I know that I kind of think yes. 
you know, if it's a, so that, well, I don't, I don't think I have any evidence to that, but um, according to the judges, there was a little more that people who in train were thought to like each other better, um, but that's a third party thing. So if you think about yourself, it just seems natural that you're going to entrain more to people that you like than people you detest. Because uh, with people, I mean, and this has no basis in anything except my feeling that that would be a place to look. Um, well, we, well, we applied for, you know, Mexico adaptation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think right. we discussed so there's that earlier. Mm-hmm. Hence my, my question is what's happening with the um, yeah. Mexican adaptation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, you can also get into political debate. Is anyone in training there? Because they usually oh, yeah. don't like each other terribly much. But that would be another interesting, lots and lots of data that you could look at um, in this category. So I invite you guys to go out there and check it out. Kind of interesting. OK. Thanks, Becky. Thanks for inviting me.